Okay, so the objectives for this video are to go over the anatomy. I also want to go over the indications for the exam. Um, I'm going to spend a large amount of the time going over the protocol because I want, uh, especially for the new stenographer and the students, to get down the protocol of the exam. And then go over the pathology of renal artery stenosis, which is the main big deal. But also cover uh, fibromuscular dysplasia just really quick. I'm not going to go very in-depth into the pathology, but I will go over for renal artery stenosis. Okay, so this is a diagram of the anatomy. Right here you have your IVC. Um, the liver is not in, the, in this image. So you have your IVC. Posterior to the IVC is the right renal artery. Here's your aorta, superior mesenteric artery. The right renal artery is longer than the left renal artery. As you can see in this image, and you'll see in scanning because the aorta is to the left of the body. There's a short distance between the aorta and the left kidney. All right, so renal arterial anatomy. You have your main renal artery right here, which comes off the aorta. The segmental arteries, there's usually about five that can vary. The interlobar arteries, make sure they're right here. Here they're saying that this is arcuate, but I believe that these are the arcuates here. And then the interlobulars will be... They're all the way at the very superficial part of the cortex. And here's a, an ultrasound image. That's your segmental, interlobar, arcuates, and then interlobular. Again, same thing here. Here's the segmentals, right there. Interlobars, the arcuates, and then the interlobulars. Okay, so one thing uh, you have to know about renal artery dopplers is that there's anatomical variations. Uh, many people have more than one renal artery. A lot of people have two, some people have three. 14 to 25% of the population has multiple renal arteries on one side or on both. Um, here you can see this patient has three. This is a CT angio showing also three. And then this is a fetal, fetal sonogram showing Two renal arteries on both sides of the aorta. Um, some people have early branching, meaning that the artery leaves the aorta and then starts to branch into segmental before it enters the kidney. Um, another variation would be a retro aortic left renal vein, which is a, the re left renal vein. Instead of going in between the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta, it goes behind the aorta. Okay, uh, and then renal anomalies. You know, uh, people who have horseshoe kidneys or uh, pancake kidneys or, you know, they're born with only one kidney, have a unilateral kidney or a pelvic kidney, um, you have to take that into consideration uh, to try to find the renal artery. Here's a, a patient who has a horseshoe kidney, and you can see they have one renal artery on each side. The left is a little shorter, but it dips down to where the, the horseshoe kidney is. This shouldn't be a hard patient to scan, even though they have horseshoe kidney. And then this patient has a pancake kidney. You see their kidneys all the way in the bottom of the pelvis. And then, uh, you know, I see two main renal arteries, but there's a jumble of arteries there. So, and then there's another one right here. So this patient might be a little bit more difficult, especially if they really would were to have a renal artery stenosis, you would have a hard time, you know, finding one if they have many arteries here. So that's one thing to take into consideration. Okay, so the indications for the exam is uh, hypertension is number one, renal vascular hypertension, um, abdominal brewy. So if the physician is doing an exam, uh, a physical exam and they hear brewy with the stethoscope and the abdomen, if they have a known renal artery stenosis and they're following it up, elevated BUN and creatinine, um, sometimes for renal failure as well. Um, hematuria, um, we've been getting a lot of Patients, uh, they want to rule out nutcracker syndrome, which is when the SMA collapses and compresses the left renal vein and causes an obstruction. Some people with nutcracker syndrome can have hematuria. Okay, so technique and protocol. You want the patient to be MPO. Of course, in an ideal world, that's how you will get the patient, but a lot of times you, don't, you won't get a patient that's MPO. Um, but the patient should be eight, MPO for 8 to 12 hours. You should use a curved transducer. You know, anywhere from 3 to 7 megahertz, you can stay in the 5 megahertz range. But if your patient is very small or if it's a baby, don't be scared to use the, the 9 linear or even the 15 linear. 
you can get some pretty nice images with that, especially of the vascular parts, uh, intrarenal parts. If you're doing the patient on a lateral decubitus, you can put a pillow under them and that can spread the ribs a little bit more and have their arm, if you're scanning on the right, their right arm above their head and that will spread the ribs a little bit more and give you a, a nicer, an easier view. Uh, when you're uh, Dopplering the vessels, you want to use a small sample volume, so 3 millimeters, 2 millimeters. Um, you want to be able to use color Doppler and difficult patients, or even in non-difficult patients, you could also use power Doppler. You get really nice images. Um, you have to know the limitations, you know, if the patient's 400 pounds and they're super gassy, you're going to have a hard time. You should still try though. But, you know, there are limitations, there's just some patients that no matter what you do, you're not going to get good images. And when you're doing Doppler, increase the sweep speed so you can get a nice trace, uh, a nice waveform to measure. Another thing I missed was uh, explain the importance of breathing. Um, in this video right here, I'm gonna put. You see, if you're trying to Doppler that vessel there, as they're breathing, is moving in and out of the way, so your waveform is gonna come and it's gonna go. So breathing is the most important part of the exam. If the patient has COPD and they can't hold their breath, you're going to have a hard time if the patient's a baby. But if you increase the sweep speed, that'll help you. I cannot stress how much we should tell the patient to hold their breath and to be able to hold their breath for a, a considerable amount of time. Now I'm going to go to the protocol. When you begin your exam, you want to start in the aorta. Okay, here's a clip showing the, the color flow in the aorta. You want to take grayscale images, color images, and uh, spectral wave analysis. You can see a nice aorta waveform. It's at 138 centimeters per second. Um, you want to make sure your scales are set correct. Here, see it's aliasing. That's not a good scale. Or if it's too low also, you, uh, that's not a good scale. So sweep speed and scale, you want to make sure that they're set correctly. Okay, after you finish your a uh, aorta, you go to the IVC, proximal. You see right here going into the right atrium. Here you can see the right renal artery behind the IVC. And there's going to be a... Phasic, phasicity in the, the waveform of the IVC as the patient breathes. Okay, so then you go to the renal arteries. Now there's two approaches for the renal arteries. That's anterior. So you're scanning right in the anterior part of the abdomen. Um, if they're very gassy, you're going to have a hard time. Sometimes you might have to push a little hard to displace the gases laterally. And here's a transverse image. You can see the superior mesenteric artery, the aorta, right renal artery. IVC here is kind of collapsed, but you see how the right renal artery courses behind the IVC. And the SMV, this is pancreas. And here's a color Doppler uh, image. Here's your aorta, right renal artery, left renal artery. It's uh, color encoded in blue because it's, you know, the arteries, when they leave the, the aorta, they, uh, they kind of course posteriorly. So this blood flow is going away from your transducer face, so it's going to be color coded in blue. Um, if you angle the transducer, you'll be able to pick it up in red. Here is a color, a power Doppler view of the same arteries. Aorta, left renal artery, right renal artery, and then this is a, the left renal vein. You can see this is SMA, so the left renal vein courses between the aorta and the SMA. All right, here's another view of the right renal artery posterior to the IVC. That's very important. Uh, this view, you can even see if there's, if there's multiple renal arteries, you'll see more than uh, one circle. And here's with, with Doppler. And uh, if you're having a hard time getting the, the anterior approach, the, the vessel and longitudinal, you can go to the IVC, find your right renal artery behind it, and then, and then turn 90 degrees. And you will see the right renal artery in longitudinal. Here's a, a clip of that showing that. 90 degrees, and boom. There's your right renal artery with the right renal vein. So that's a, a, a neat trick. Okay, so if you're scanning your arteries through the anterior approach, you can use angles depending on where you're, you know, if you put the Doppler here, you're not gonna pick up any, uh, any signal, because that's like 90 degrees to the beam. You'll pick up some. So you wanna to, to angle your transducer or have the patient turn over. Here, the, the arteries are dipping away. So I'm at a 45 degree angle, and you're getting a nice clean spectral waveform, nice spectral window, 133 centimeters per second. Here's another view, I've angled uh, more to the left, and I'm getting the, the vessel, and the artery and the vein in longitudinal. 
And then this is at the hilum, right renal vein, right renal artery. Next, the coronal approach. You'll see what they call the banana peel sign because it looks like a you know banana peeled, peeled open. So if you're approaching from the right side, this vessel is going to be the right uh, renal artery. And this is the left renal artery. It's blue because the blood flow is going away from the transducer. And here they're labeled right renal artery, left renal artery, and then this is IVC. This is the liver. Okay, so flank approach coronally, you can see the vessel completely. This is renal tissue here, and this is the right renal artery. You can see it all the way through. So if there's any aliasing, you'll be able to see it there. If there's an actual stenosis, you'll be able to see it. And another view here, coronally, you can see the vessel completely. And uh, right here, you can see it superimposed on the right renal vein. So these are nice views. Um, and then uh, if you're doing a flank approach, you really don't have to do an angle because zero degrees is the best angle for your Doppler. And and this and these images, you will be zero degrees or a little off. And this image, you can tell I'm not zero degrees, but this is a 45 degree angle here. And this is probably like 30 degrees. So that's a pretty good angle. You don't need a, uh, to put an angle on your sample volume. And you get a nice clean tracing right here. You have a very uh, sharp upstroke, systolic upstroke, and your dichrotic notch, and then a lot of diastole. Okay, so next you wanna do renal veins. Um, this is like a coronal view on the right. You have uh, the right renal vein and the IVC. On transverse, here's the both vessels at the hilum, renal artery and renal vein. And this is with color Doppler. Here you see a nice view going into the, the right kidney and the IVC. And then Dopplering also with, uh, you know, phasicity as is normally seen in these vessels. Um, like the renal artery and everything else, you always want grayscale, color Doppler, and uh, pulse wave Doppler images. All right, so now to the intrarenal vessels. The AIUM protocol says that you got to do the segmentals in the superior, mid, and inferior poles of the kidney. You know, there's always going to be some variability and from, uh, from institution to institution. Some places want both. So here, this is a Doppler with a segmental, and a nice, very nice waveform, 70 uh, centimeters per second. Uh, the resistive index is 0. 0.65, that's normal. And then, as you go further up the cortex, your velocity is going to be lower, because the arteries are smaller. Uh, here, the arcuate is nice and 21 centimeters per second. Resistive index, 0. 0.59, that's normal. Okay, so when you're doing these uh, protocols, you also want to do grayscale images of the both kidneys, you know, to check for uh, renal asymmetry, to see if there's any masses or cysts or um, any uh, increased echogenicities or anything like that. Okay, so now to the pathology. Renal stenosis occurs in about 5% of all hypertensive patients. So not a whole lot. So you're going to do a lot of normals. 75% um, of uh, renal artery stenosis is caused by atherosclerotic plaque. Here in this image you can see atherosclerosis, fatty plaque along the wall of the aorta going into the, the renal artery. All right, and 95% of the lesions are osteal or occur at the ostium, which is the origin of the renal artery. So where the artery takes off of the aorta. So this would be the ostium here. All right, the parameters we use um, for for doing these exams and for finding out if there's renal artery stenosis is a peak systolic velocity. Normal is uh, below 180 centimeters per second. And diastolic velocity, you want to make sure that there's a lot of diastolic flow. If there's no diastolic flow or reversal, that's at normal. Um, resistive index, 0.70 and below is normal. Uh, we do the resistive indexes in the, in the intraparenchymal renal arteries. Um, acceleration time. 7 millimeters or 0 0.07 seconds below that is normal, above that is not normal. Uh, and we also use the renal aortic ratio, where we divide the renal artery into the, the aorta, peak systolic of both, to get a, a renal aortic ratio, less than 3.5 is, is normal. Uh, we also check for aliasing at sites of stenosis, but you know, ch um, changing your parameters of your, your color doppler, kind of make sure if that aliasing is true or if it's just uh, aliasing from artifact. All right, so when you have a renal artery stenosis, here you can see this is a CT angio of a renal artery stenosis. This is the right kidney here. You can see it's a lot smaller than the left kidney. The left renal artery is completely open. The right renal artery, a 
appears to stop right there, but it continues, so that's a very, very tight stenosis. Uh, if you double this area, it's going to be a, a normal waveform. Nice, sharp, fast acceleration time and uh, dichrotic notch with a lot of diastolic flow. Um, if you Doppler here at the at the stenosis, you're going to have very, very high velocities if there is still flow left. Um, spectral broadening. Um, the velocities you know can be anything above 180, but it can be 200, 300. And then if you scan at the hilum, you're going to have a Tardis Parvis waveform. Tardis Parvis just means that there's increased acceleration time. So instead of having a nice sharp upstroke, we have a delayed upstroke. Okay, so it's Tardis Parvis is seen post stenotically. It is, uh, and it's a diagnostic of a stenosis um, proximal to wherever you're getting the part of Tardis Parvis flow. Okay, so the direct criteria for renal artery stenosis: peak systolic velocity greater than 180 centimeters per second. Um, uh, velocity is of 200 centimeters per second and above are predictive of a, at least 60% stenosis or higher. Uh, renal aortic ratio greater than 3.5. post stenotic turbulence, which you can see right here. They doppler after the, the stenosis and it's very turbulent. Absence of flow also. I mean, if you have, if you have a very clear view of a renal artery and there's no flow and a very atrophic uh, kidney, then it's probably a chronic obstruction and then here is a very high peak systolic velocity of about 300 in a renal artery stenosis all right here's another view you have 505 centimeters per second that's super high you see a spectral broadening here you have it at a this one's at about 246.6 centimeters per second very high as well and then here you have a normal waveform, like I said before, sharp, fast upstroke, dichrotic notch, and tons of diastolic flow. That's your uh, typical normal renal artery waveform. Uh, one thing also, usually the peak systolic velocity is at the first part of systole, but sometimes the after the dichrotic notch is a little higher, so that would be your peak systole. Okay, so indirect criteria for renal artery stenosis is... Like I said before, TARDIS parvus waveforms at the renal hilum. Uh, renal asymmetry of greater than 2 centimeters per second. So if your right kidney is 10 centimeters and your left kidney is 7, you know, try to find a, a stenosis. Uh, resistive indices in the intrarenal parenchymal arteries greater than 0.80. And delayed acceleration time greater than 0 0.07 seconds or 7, millimeter, uh, 7 milliseconds, which is what TARDIS Parvis is. Okay, here you have uh, some spectral waveforms that are normal and then on the right, abnormal. These are the normal ones. See, they all have fast acceleration times. They all have that little sharp upstroke, dichrotic notches everywhere, and tons of diastolic flow. And then here you have various types of TARDIS Parvis waveforms with delayed upstroke. You know, the more severe it gets, the more TARDIS Parvis your waveform becomes. All right, and then uh, another finding, which is rare, um, is fibromuscular dysplasia. It's an angiopathy of medium-sized vessels, arteries in the body. It can be in the brain, the abdomen. Um, they typically, when you have fibromuscular dysplasia, uh, renal involvement happens 60 to 75% of the time. Um, here you have a nice diagram here where you get thickening of the arterial walls, which causes stenosis, and it looks like little beads. Um, you know, they call it the string of beads and the string of pearl sign. Here you can see those involutions right there that, that give it that appearance. And here's even a CT angio showing it perfectly clear. It affects females more than males at a 3 to 4 to 1 ratio. And typically women of childbearing age. It, although it can be seen in older people and it has been found in, uh, in the pediatric population as well. So that's pretty much it. We, uh, we covered uh, the anatomy, uh, um, a lot of the protocol, and some pathology. I hope um, you guys uh, find this useful. I'm Henry, and thanks for watching. Take care.